Hello, everyone, and welcome to UOA On Demand. My name is Dr. KG Swan, and I specialize in sports medicine. And here with me today are Drs. Patrick Buckley and Chris Barrow. Today, we are discussing PCL injuries, or posterior cruciate ligament injuries. Many people have heard about uh, ACL injuries. It's commonly in the news, but PCL is a little bit less common, less talked about. So, Dr. Bayro, maybe you could uh, you could start us off. What what's the PCL? Where is that? So the PCL is the largest and probably the strongest intraarticular ligament, which means in the joint uh, within the knee. Uh, it's located towards the back of the knee. Um, and we don't hear about it too often because typically we don't operate on it as much um, and we're able to treat it fairly well non-operatively. Um, it attaches on the tibia on the back of the most uh, proximal portion of the tibia and then attaches to the femur on the inside uh, wall right in the middle of the joint. Okay, so we don't hear about these injuries much are these would you call these common injuries dr buckley no they're certainly not as common as an acl tear which usually happens um from a non-contact kind of pivoting injury you know these are these are usually more from a direct blow and you know they can be probably most commonly from a dashboard injury so if somebody's in a car accident and you know where you're sitting in the car goes directly backwards into the knee that can uh, damage your pcl or tear your pcl um, it can happen in the sports field. So football players or other athletes can land directly on their knee. And, you know, if you think about your foot kind of be pointing um, down, that can allow your knee to directly hit the ground. And um, that's actually not that uncommon in a football field. So you can have it in the more um, recreational or athletic setting as well. Um, and then we also see them in these kind of combined injuries. So when, you know, a car accident or a athletic injury happens and you tear more than one ligament, you know, often the PCL can be involved with that. And that's kind of a, a term multi-ligamentous knee and sometimes can present when the knee actually dislocates out of position. Um, but those are all the, the main ways that I think this happens. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's something that, you know, we see a fair amount as, um, as sports medicine surgeons and, you know, really assessing what's going on and assessing what else potentially is injured is a big part of treating them correctly. Right, right. So, okay. So the mechanism is important. Like many of the injuries we see, it's important for us to get an understanding of the history and how did this happen? So a dashboard injury with the knee smacks against the dashboard in a car accident or, or direct blow to the knee in a football game. Um, but, uh, but, but how would you say, Dr. Barrow, how would you say these present? So you're in the office, say, uh, and someone, someone comes in, how, how might they look and, and how would you say is that different than maybe an ACL or perhaps an MCL injury? Well, that's a good question. Uh, so what we typically see is a lot of swelling. And I think probably PCL injuries are uh, common for, or known for being one of the most common causes of knee swelling. Um, and so we'll see a swollen knee, uh, difficult to walk on, difficult to put pressure on. Uh, a lot of the pain will be directed at the back of the knee. So posteriorly, uh, a lot of people will complain that there's you know, just a lot of pain in that area. Uh, as they start to put more weight on it, let's say some time has passed, a few days or a week before they come in, they may notice the, the leg is unstable, um, that they're not really able to put weight on it. They don't feel too sure about walking on it. Um, and a lot of times that could be not only related to a uh, PCL injury, but as Dr. Buckley was saying, a multi-ligamentous knee injury. So they may have other ligaments involved that kind of contribute to that instability. So that's the way they'll present. It's really kind of a, it's not something small. You know, when you walk in with a PCL injury, it's definitely something you notice, you know there's something wrong with your knee and most of that pain is at the back of the knee. All right, so, so something's wrong with the knee. Certainly if there's another ligament involved, this was a, a, a violent impact of some sort um, compared to say, an ACL injury, which we often describe as, as non-contact injuries. Um, do do non-contact injuries happen with, um, can you injure your PCL with a non-contact injury? What do you think, Dr. Buckley? I think it's possible, but you know, usually these are more higher energy injuries. Um, anything is possible. Rotationally, you can definitely have injuries that start 
on the medial or inside or start on the lateral side and then kind of the force continues to the back of the knee. So, um, you know, I think anything is possible as we all have seen. And, and for those, you know, of us who take care of it, having like a high index of suspicion is I think super important. And, you know, ultimately we do the same exam almost every time, you know, with a patient who presents with relatively, you know, lower level um, pain or somebody who has a big traumatic injury. We try to examine each structure in the knee and get a feel for whether that's functioning or not. So having that exam and being able to reproduce that is I think really helpful. And then you can tell whether or not that's involved um, for that person. Okay, so sticking with that, that thought, how do you diagnose it? What's your exam show or, or what else are you using in your diagnostic workup, Dr. Bowman? Yeah, so I think, you know, as you talked about, the history is a big part of that, but when you transition to the exam, as Dr. Bayro said, usually you're looking for a swelling or an effusion. And many times if you have um, the person kind of bend their knee, you'll see that their tibia um, will actually sag backwards. And um, that's kind of called a sag sign, which is a, a sign of, um, of a PCL injury. Not as common, you know, up front in the acute setting, but especially chronic injuries or ones that have been going on for a while, you would notice that, um, you know, certainly doing a good exam and examining all of the other ligaments is a big part of it. But, you know, really the hallmark of checking for a PCL is to kind of bend the knee up and do what's called a posterior drawer. So you're actually testing the function of the PCL and you're seeing if there's a structure that's pushing back against you as you push the tibia backwards. So um, if it's working, you're gonna get a very firm rock hard endpoint. Um, and if it's not, you're gonna be able to push the tibia backwards. And you know that's something that um, the person's gonna know and you're gonna know that feel of if there's more motion uh, of the knee. And then, you know, I think this is where it comes into, ultimately it's subjective, right? We tend to grade PCL injuries based on how far you can move the tibia in relation to the femur. And we talk about grade one or grade two or grade three injuries. And, you know, there's some, um, you know, basically zero to five millimeters. We think about a more minor grade one injury and that's going to go up from there every five millimeters. But honestly, it's relatively subjective and, and we all may have a little bit of a different feel for that. So I do think having an objective measure and you can do a kneeling stress x-ray in the office that I know that that we do to try to get an objective measurement and you can have somebody kneel on their knee and then you can, you know, take a little bit of that subjective nature out of that. So uh, it's been a very helpful thing. And certainly in the chronic setting where you're looking at um, other injuries and trying to see if the PCL is involved, that objective kneeling stress x-ray, I think is a nice thing to do. So Dr. Barrow, Dr. Buckley mentioned some stress x-rays. You, do you think we always have to get x-rays with this type of uh, injury diagnosis and what other modalities are you using for, for diagnosis? So absolutely. I mean, we all start with uh, x-rays as our first line of imaging. Um, if we are suspicious based on the mechanism that there is a posterior uh, cruciate ligament injury, uh, I think stress radiography is a great idea. And that kind of gives us an idea of exactly how bad it might be injured, as Dr. Buckley alluded to. So if we're using uh, different increments, uh, you can look at the amount of millimeters that the, uh, the tibia is uh, posteriorly directed on a stress radiograph. And what that means is uh, in order to perform these stress radiographs, you kind of have a patient uh, bend their knee at 90 degrees and uh, place it over a pillow, for example, and just kind of have them lean onto it. And then once you take the x-ray, you can see how far back the shin bone has actually moved and you can do that compared to the other side. Um, once, you, uh, once you kind of get those measurements, that'll give you an idea of how bad uh, of an injury you have. Of course, uh, we can confirm the diagnosis with an MRI, which is usually the next step after getting an X-ray or a stress radiography. Okay, so MRI. So you need an MRI to, to evaluate the, the PCL, fair to say? Absolutely. You don't need it, but it's definitely very, very helpful. And I agree, because why would you say? Well, what, what are you looking at on the MRI? I think the MRI is very helpful for a number of different things. Uh, you can see whether the uh, actual contour of the PCL is completely disrupted, whether or not you have a complete tear or a partial tear. It's very helpful for diagnosing for that or confirming from that. Uh, you can also look for other ligamentous injuries, uh, as we spoke about before. So whether or not the posterior lateral corner is involved or even an ACL injury, uh, 
Uh, you can also look for meniscus tears or even chondral damage, cartilage issues. Uh, the MRI is very helpful for that as well. And I completely agree. So as we had mentioned earlier, these can be violent injuries and other structures can certainly be injured and need to be addressed surgically, whether or not you're, you're going to, to, to have to fix the PCL. Which, which brings me to treatment options. So, okay, so um, we think uh, we, we've diagnosed a, a PCL injury by way of our history, by way of our exam, and then our radiographic workup, including an MRI. Um, so someone has a PCL injury, Dr. Buckley, what, what are you, what are you, what's your thought process in terms of how are you gonna treat that patient and that injury? Sure, so I think that, you know, understanding the grade of the injuries, so the vast majority of grade one and grade two injuries, you know, you're going to treat non-operatively, um, but a combined injury and injury non-operatively, sorry, non-operatively. So that's going to raise some questions. You're going to treat a ligament tear non-operatively. You are, yeah. And the, and the reality is that you can um, have good return to sport, good return to your activities, and good um, function after uh, that type of injury. Uh, because in general, your, your PCL helps prevent the tibia from going backwards on the uh, you know, in relation to the femur. So if you can do really good quad rehab or basically the, the part of your knee that helps pull your uh, tibia anteriorly or towards the front, then many people can compensate and they may not know um, any difference and have good stability to your knee. So you know, non-operative management really focuses on really good quadriceps kind of strength and function for that. Um, I think usually I would have somebody be, you know, either toe touch or kind of limit their weight bearing for um, usually at least three, maybe four weeks after a, a true PCL injury. Um, and I think one of the big differences is that, you know, you would start range of motion and therapy right away, but you want to have them start kind of motion on their belly. So they're doing prone motion so that gravity doesn't help bring the tibia backwards and they can keep working on motion in a safe manner. So again, these are all ways that we're trying to not only limit and kind of restore all the strength of the, um, of the person's knee, but limit any additional stretching or injury that happens as the knee is recovering um, in that rehab process. Um, I do think that there's a couple different braces that are really nice for this. There's a couple braces that will provide a force that goes anteriorly. Um, and those are you know, different things that I think do help a lot with a patient who's going through a, a PCL rehab. And that's how I would usually treat a kind of grade one or, or grade two injury that's isolated, meaning it's just the PCL involved. And then as you start looking at other ligaments and a very unstable knee in the setting of a much higher energy trauma, um, you know, knee dislocation, things like that, those are ones that usually we're reconstructing or fixing. Um, I think there's a small area for a kind of repair of a PCL from a avulsion. Um, so if the PCL tears off the back of the tibia, I think there is uh, and there's like a fleck of bone that is involved with that. I think you could potentially repair that. Um, and that's where, again, where x-rays and imaging would be really helpful to try to figure out what the right thing to do is. But in general, these are not kind of um, like if it's torn in the mid-substance, not things we can just sew back together. We actually have to replace it with a graft or reconstruct it. I just wanted to uh, uh, add that I think it's an important point about uh, what Dr. Buckley said about this being non-operative. Uh, if a patient walks into the office and says, well, doc, you know, my ligament is torn. Don't we need to fix it? Uh, in contrast to like an ACL injury, we're almost always reconstructing that or, or trying to fix that. The PCL, most often we don't have to. Most often we can treat that non-operatively. And they do quite well, right? They do quite well, like Dr. Buckley said. So, so you mentioned grade ones and grade twos, potentially non-operative. Um, grade three, do you, there, there is some some debate out there. Do you think, Dr. Barrow, you can have an isolated grade three injury, or if it's a grade three unstable PCL, does that do you think that means they have additional injuries to the knee? So uh, that's a good question, and most of the time, it really does mean that they have some other ligamentous injury involved, uh, particularly what we call uh, referred to as the posterior lateral corner of the knee. So the back part of the knee on the side uh, usually provides some stability and is inherently related to the PCL. And so when you have this kind of an injury, uh, you're kind of uh, damaging all of those ligaments as a complex. Uh, as Dr. Buckley was talking about before with uh, some of the exam maneuvers, uh, one thing we can do to differentiate is what we call a dial test. Uh, 
which is where we can have a patient uh, on their, their belly and just kind of bend their knees at different flexion angles and externally rotate uh, their lower legs. And from there, we can kind of figure out whether or not there is any involvement of the PCL along with uh, other ligaments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then in that scenario, PLC, posterior lateral corner plus PCL, uh, we're, we're most likely operating on those, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I think those combined injuries, they just don't do well with non-operative management. If the person feels their knee be quite unstable, they, they really would come in and say, I just can't trust the knee. I can't, you know, plant and try to change directions and expect the knee to kind of support that. Um, and the problem is then if you continue to do that and your knee buckles or gives way, that's when other things in your knee get damaged, your cartilage and your meniscus, you know, really being the big, the big ones that you worry about with that. So I would agree. Those are all ones that, that I'd recommend fixing. So then, and maybe you can both uh, chime in here, but uh, maybe start with Dr. Buckley. Uh, as far as the surgery goes, can you briefly summarize how you might do that? Or are there different ways to do that? Uh, there are. And I think that, you know, this is something that uh, is a little bit controversial or debated whether you need to reconstruct both bundles of the PCL. So your PCL has actually got two different bundles that um, work at different flexion angles. So one, you know, when your knee is straight, it helps prevent the tibia from going backward. And one, when your knee is bent at 90 degree, it helps prevent the tibia from going posteriorly. And, um, you know, historically, uh, initially you would reconstruct kind of the main bundle, uh, your anterior lateral bundle, and um, kind of let that be your main stability of your knee. Uh, I would say that my preference in, in my practice is to reconstruct construct both bundles. And I think this is an important takeaway because this has never been shown to, to really help the um, uh, ACL, right? This was looked at a lot and double bundle reconstruction on the ACL, you know, ultimately has, has I think pretty much fallen out of favor. I think that's a pretty fair statement to say, mm -hmm. but on the PCL, um, I think it actually has very good data and the biomechanics, which is where you're looking at the strength of that reconstruction. And then you know, the outcomes of people and comparing, um, reconstructing one versus two bundles, certainly I, def, I do think supports reconstructing both of them. Um, but in general, as you alluded to, to answer your question, you know, you're basically creating uh, two sockets on the femur um, and you're using almost always some sort of uh, allograft tissue. So, you know, that's another part of this as you compare it to an ACL, the outcomes of a cadaver tendon with your own tissue are actually um, very similar. And in the setting of multiple ligaments that may need to be fixed in the knee, you just can't take the grass from all the different places you need to, to kind of fix all of those. So most commonly we're using a cadaver tendon for this and the outcomes are really good. Um, and one kind of tunnel or socket on the tibia to then place the PCL on the right spot and allow it to work to prevent posterior translation of the knee. Nice, so double bundle PCL reconstruction uh, probably better than single bundle, um, from what I gathered there in the literature that I'm familiar with, um, compared to ACL, which double bundle ACL reconstruction fell out of favor several years ago. Um, so then, Dr. Barrow, is this arthroscopic, or can you do this open, or what do you prefer? So uh, historically, uh, this has been done as what we call an inlay technique, which is where you can open up or approach through the back of the knee and uh, kind of recreate the PCL that way. Uh, going back to uh, what we mentioned about bony avulsion. So if the PCL rips off with a fleck of bone, for mm -hmm. example, that might be one way to approach this as well. Um, but most of the time I would submit that we're doing this arthroscopically. So we're reconstructing this through all minimally invasive holes uh, all around the knee uh, and putting a tendon there to recreate the double bundles of the PCL. Uh, and as an aside, I guess, as we were mentioning before about allograft versus autograft, uh, really there's no good literature that says one is better than the other in comparison to something like ACL literature, which really says that uh, for younger patients, at least, allograft is, is a no-no. It's not something that we really use or we want to stay away from. Uh, so here we definitely have that option of using cadaver graft. And I would think most of the time we probably do use that for PCL reconstruction. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Tend to use a, a, an allograft for that. Yeah, oftentimes there's a lot of work to do because 
There's other ligaments injured uh, at the trauma centers. This can be a multi-ligamentous injury with a, a prolonged surgery. And so um, trying to get all that work done and trying not to, to violate the knee with, with harvesting grafts sometimes is the, uh, the thought process there. Uh, Dr. Buckley, would you say this is pretty much the same type of surgery as, as doing an ACL or is this more technically demanding reconstructing the PCL? I would say the latter for sure. Uh, you know, I think ACL is pretty common. Uh, the techniques are certainly more commonly done, but most people are not doing a high volume of PCL injuries. Certainly they're just less common injuries. And, and as we talked about, they can, you know, have non-operative management. Um, but for, for bigger injuries and combined injuries, you know, I think there's a lot of value to going to a place and a person that does a lot of PCL um, reconstructions because, you know, they're just, they're, they're harder surgeries. Um, you, you know, have a little bit more, you're basically putting your tibial tunnel kind of right in the back of the knee. So you have to be very careful with the blood vessel and nerve that run behind it. Um, and I think this, you know, something that most of us who do them, and I know that everybody on the, the call today, you know, you have a team where everybody's kind of in tune with the whole plan and ready to take care of that patient. Um, and that's just not true for places that don't do a lot of this. So um, it is more demanding. It's, it's something that, you know, has a little longer rehab. Um, and as we talked about, it's a kind of the strongest ligament in your knee. So it's an important one to get right and get right in the first time because um, it's something that is a certainly a harder situation in the revision setting uh, if something didn't go well the first time. Agreed, agreed. And you mentioned rehab. Can you touch on that a little bit more, Dr. Buckley? What What is the rehab after a PCL reconstruction compared sure. to yeah. an ACL reconstruction? Yeah, so I think a couple a uh, couple points. One is usually I would have somebody on crutches for about six weeks after the surgery. Um, you know, again, that it's a, a important ligament not to stretch. And and one of the downsides of reconstructions is that with the cadaver tendons, you may have part of it that stretches a little bit. So you want to really limit the weight bearing up front, so you don't have any stretching that happens early on. Um, and you know, as we talked about before, you want to really work on getting their motion back. So that's the main goal. Um, but doing that in the prone position or laying on your belly really helps limit that stretching of any um, tendon grafts you're going to use to reconstruct the PCL. Um, I think that, you know, motion is a big part of it. And then as they start getting walking and, and weight bearing that quad rehab or, or kind of the other structure of the knee that's going to protect your PCL, getting that very strong is a big part of the rehab. You know, I think it's a little longer rehab than an ACL. I tell most people who have a PCL tear and a PCL reconstruction uh, that needs surgery that you're really looking at about a year um, back to all activities. And um, I would tell someone with an ACL more in the eight to nine month range. So it's definitely a longer kind of process because you wanna make sure you really fully rehab that uh, and then get them back to their, to their uh, sport or their activity. Agreed, agreed. So, okay, so we've talked about um, PCL, what it is and where it is, and then how it's injured, um, how we work that up and some of the treatment options. I thought maybe we could uh, just go over a couple of cases um, and, and discuss it that way uh, in the last few minutes here. So maybe sure. Dr. Barrow, I'll start, I'll start with you. Um, uh, this is a theoretical patient. We got a 21 year old college football player um, who, who limps off the field uh, in the third quarter. Uh, his knee's sore. It feels swollen to him. Uh, he thinks he took a helmet to the knee um, actually in, in the first half. Um, uh, on, on exam, uh, he has a swollen knee and he has um, good range of motion and he is, uh, has a little bit of laxity to his posterior drawer maneuver. Not a lot of laxity, but a little bit. Otherwise, he's stable in terms of his Lachman's test, his pivot, no varus or valgus. So um, what are you thinking? And, and uh, what are his chances for returning that game, that season, that year? What's your, what's your thought process there? How'd you work that up? So based on the mechanism that you described and his examination findings, he's probably got an isolated PCL injury. Um, I think the next step after confirming that would be to figure out exactly how bad it's injured. Uh, so whether or not this is kind of a partial PCL injury or a complete PCL injury, and that would kind of direct uh, what we do. That as well as, uh, as you mentioned, he's an athlete, he's a young athlete, he's gonna play more sports. He's gonna Can have- Can you go back 
Oh. Can you go back that game? No. So he definitely would we'd be able to take him out of the game right there. Um, so that's, you know, that's one thing. And then we'd have to continue the workup again, talking about uh, x-rays, uh, stress radiography, potentially, and definitely an MRI. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'd evaluate his tear from there. Okay. So, so then the workup continues. Uh, he does get an MRI. There's no additional injuries. And he has some inflammation and some, some partial tearing in his PCL, Dr. Buckley. Um, so uh, we're going to call it a grade, a grade one PCL. Um, what do you think? It's the beginning of his, uh, his uh, junior season and his college football season. What do you think um, chances are of him getting back on the field this season? I think the season are quite good. Um, you know, I would tell them that I would usually rehab this and I would give him a general timeline of probably, you know, the earliest, maybe three, but three, four, six weeks. It just depends on how they rehab it. But in general, probably around four weeks for that. Um, that might be a little conservative depending on how quickly they recover and how they look to you. Um, you know, but I think this is where we really, you know, lean on our physical therapists. We work with closely and, you know, we try to do objective measures. We try to simulate what it's like to be in that game and can they perform? Can they trust their knee? Can they plant that knee in the ground and change direction? And if they can do that repetitively without fatiguing and losing some of their, um, you know, mechanics, then yeah, they can go back to play. But if we simulate them and do some objective return to sport testing and they don't look great and they don't do very well, then that's the person that needs more time. Um, and I do think there's a little bit of a broad kind of spectrum. Someone may do quite well and just need a couple of weeks and someone may need six weeks with this. It just really depends on how they follow up with the rehab. Um, and, and one point I would just make is, you know, that's one of the nice things when this happens on the sidelines is probably the best exam you're gonna get is that right away after an injury happens with that athlete. And, you know, if, if we're there and then we see them in the office, you, you really know what that exam was right away because they tend to guard, you know, a couple of days later, a week later, there's a lot more swelling, they're more painful, more, inform more information. And, you know, it's a little bit harder to get a great exam on them, but right away, you can usually tell pretty convincingly with that exam, what's going on. And, you know, that's very helpful information to then kind of carry that through treating that patient. I wholeheartedly agree. That sideline exam might be the best exam you get other than the one in the operating room. Dr. Bayro, so that, if that kid goes back to, to playing ball, are you going to put him in a brace? Uh, so not necessarily if it's a partial PCL injury. Uh, you don't necessarily need to put him in a brace. What we would do would evaluate the amount of laxity that he has. But with the partial PCL injury, there's usually not much. And the PCL can actually tolerate a lot of laxity. Uh, and I think there are some non-operative studies that kind of do show uh, even with uh, some laxity, people generally tend to have pretty good outcomes. Um, what we would do, uh, as Dr. Buckley said, is start them in a rehab program uh, with a particular focus, I think, on quadriceps strengthening, which is somewhat protective for the PCL. Agreed. Okay, well then let's shift gears to, to one additional case. Dr. Buckley, we got a 32-year-old who is involved in a high-speed motor vehicle accident. Uh, and they came in through one of our trauma centers that we work at and uh, our team worked them up and found that they had a, a loose knee. They weren't quite sure what was torn, but uh, one of the residents uh, mentioned a unstable knee and they thought the PCL was out. Uh, and the patient has multiple other injuries as they often do, such as a pelvis fracture and maybe a head injury. Um, what's your thought process there? So the resident seems to think there's a PCL and maybe more. Um, how's, how do, what do we do there and how is that different than that athlete on the field? Sure. So, you know, that then goes to, you know, really how do you evaluate a trauma patient? And I think the, the biggest thing is, you know, even if you took the, the pelvis and the other injuries out of it, you know, that patient should be admitted, right? So there's, there's a lot of, um, kind of concern that if you have a very, um, you know, loose or sloppy knee and you have more than one ligaments that maybe that was a knee dislocation that reduced and, you know, those are the patients that when they get missed and they say, well, your knee, you know, doesn't feel great, but x-rays are fine and there's no fractures and they get sent out and then they start having more pain overnight. And that's how, you know, neurovascular injuries can be missed. So, you know, I definitely would, would admit those patients to watch them. 
And you definitely need a very good exam of their pulse um, and the nerves that kind of go past the knee to make sure that those are all working. And then they stay working for, you know, at least the first 24 hours after the injury. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. And then, you know, the other thing is, I think the x-rays matter. If the x-rays show that the joint is reduced, you know, initially, and maybe historically, a lot of times we would consider putting that person into an X-fix or an external fixator where there's pins that go in the bone and um, kind of bars that come outside of the bone to stabilize the knee. And, you know, I think in general, if the knee is reduced and it's not subluxing um, backwards, I think that's really a little bit overkill and um, they can be managed um, very nicely without that X-fix. So, it does kind of delay a little bit. Um, certainly if there's an athlete who has that, I think it does affect their rehab. So if they need it, there's vascular injuries, other things, I think the X-Fix matters. But in general, I think that maybe we're rethinking a little bit of when and how often we need that for a, a multi-leg uh, injury like this. And I think most can do very well without an X-Fix. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, so what, what else we got to do there after that? So the We've, the patient's been stabilized, Dr. Bayro, and, and um, we've assessed their neurovascular status, which I totally agree, Dr. Buckley. That's crucial. Those patients need to be admitted, I agree, um, and, uh, and make sure that the, the knee's reduced. It's uh, not dislocated. Now, now, what do you want to do? So if it's not dislocated and the patient's stable, again, neurovascular exam has been checked and, uh, and they're okay there, uh, then we go about determining what needs to be uh, repaired or reconstructed and how we would go about stabilizing this knee definitively. Um, again, I do think to some extent, uh, patient population plays a part in this. So what is a patient's demands? What kind of patient are we dealing with? Is it a young patient, for example, that's an athlete? And then we're obviously gonna be slightly more aggressive, I would say, with uh, surgically stabilizing this patient. Um, if we look at some of uh, uh, perhaps an older, more sedentary population, uh, which has like an ultra low velocity type of an injury that uh, can cause a PCL um, tear as well as a, a multi-ligamentous tear. Um, we may still surgically stabilize these patients, but again, they may be uh, more amenable to something like an external fixator as, uh, mm -hmm. as we talked about earlier. So with this particular patient, obviously we would continue the workup and then once we find out which ligaments are involved, uh, potentially develop a surgical plan as to uh, reconstructing these ligaments. Right. So we need, we need more of an exam. We need more of a radiographic workup, MRI, of course, and then, and then make our plan, which, as, as we all know, can, can require a long day in the operating room and you have to fix more than just the PCL. If it's other ligaments involved or the meniscus or the cartilage or tendons, uh, it can be a, a whole day's work to get that knee stable and get that patient on their, on their road to recovery. I would agree, so, um, but they're satisfying. I mean, you, you, you know, those surgeries, you start with a knee that is, is exceptionally unstable and loose and uh, you end up with a knee that, you know, is, is stable, right? And that's a huge thing for that patient because they would never be able to put weight through that leg if it was that unstable. And um, unfortunately, when there's, you know, three, four ligaments involved, they just don't heal without surgery. So, you know, it's a, it's a very um, challenging day and it's a day that, you know, you need a team that, that has kind of done that, but it's a very satisfying thing at the end of that to feel the stability you can do when you actually reconstruct those ligaments. Agreed. Absolutely. One thing I would one thing I would uh, say as well is that this, we may have to tell patients, particularly with multi-ligamentous injuries or meniscal injuries or cartilage injuries, that this may not be their last surgery. Uh, a lot of times they may tend to get stiff. Uh, the reconstructions may fail in certain parts or the meniscal repairs may fail and they may need more things down the road. I think, I think that's absolutely true, Dr. Bayro. This, uh, when it, with this violent injury and such a big surgery, there, there sometimes is a secondary or even a third surgery that needs to be performed down the road. Um, that may just be part of the process. Uh, it is a long recovery, but then, uh, but then it is absolutely rewarding when they come, they come walking through your door, or if you see them back on the athletic field, that is, that is one heck of a good feeling. Amen to that. <laughs>
So, all right, so I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, in summary, we've discussed PCL injuries in isolation. We've discussed PCL injuries in combination with other injuries such as multi-ligamentous knee dislocation type, type injuries. Uh, we've discussed some of the mechanisms of injury, uh, the treatment options for the more mild isolated PCL injuries, and then the surgical uh, options for the more unstable PCL or PCL plus other uh, injuries. Uh, we've discussed uh, some of the rehab and return to play as well. So I feel like we've covered a lot. So I'd like to thank Dr. Buckley and Dr. Barrow for their time and wisdom tonight. Thank you for joining us here at UOA On Demand. If you think you have a PCL injury or any other knee ligament injury or really any sports medicine condition, we are here to help. You just have to look us up at uoanj.com.